was an attempt to really get realistic about what's needed to get into space to open the door to the scenes that are there all the time waiting for us to see them up close and personal to take a peek through one of the large windows and uh, fly under the uh, rings of Saturn that was unbearably exciting and that was what our life was about at that time we really believed we were going to be doing it personally By the time the Russians put a dog into Earth orbit a month later, Taylor had sold the idea of a nuclear bomb propelled spaceship with a crew of 50 men and women to his boss at General Atomics, the 34 year old physicist and entrepreneur Frederick de Hoffman. There was only one Fred de Hoffman. It was said that he knew every millionaire in the world. That's probably not true, but I bet he knew every billionaire in the world. He was very good at raising money a person who wanted results. You, you couldn't fool around if you worked for Fred D. Hoffman. If Orion were to fly, General Atomics would need government backing. De Hoffman and Taylor believed Freeman Dyson could help them get it. Undoubtedly it was true that my name was worth quite a lot because the main problem they had was just to achieve some sort of credibility. If, the, if you just t talked about the project said you were going to propel a ship with nuclear bombs and, and most of the immediate reaction was well this is crazy the whole thing will blow up and that'll be the end of it and, and so it, they needed people with solid reputation just in order to have a chance to, to get the thing approved of course the project probably went through his mind in a few minutes can we withstand the uh, temperatures, can we withstand the shocks, can we withstand the accelerations, can we carry enough people, how big does the ship have to be, and so on. And, and he decided it, it was plausible. And in about 30 seconds of mental calculation, he said, yeah, it'll work, let's go. The Dysons moved to La Jolla in Southern California. One morning in end of May, 1958, driving to school, I was told, Daddy's building a spaceship. And when we did go to General Atomic, I thought, I thought they were building the spaceship right there. I thought that big round building was the beginning of the spaceship. George was to find out later that he'd been right about scale. The circular library building at General Atomics was the same diameter as the base of a full-size Orion which would tower 200 feet above it. I can remember very well when Ted Taylor first explained the Orion idea. He said, the nuclear bomb is so strong that if you have a standard sized spaceship of the type we were thinking of for chemical propellants, the acceleration that you would have with the force on a small mass would be so large that it would pulverize the uh, spaceship. He said, let's make it big. Let's make it instead of a few tons, let's make it a few thousand tons. And this means with the same force, you would have much less acceleration. Because it has to be so big, we should change the way we think of spacecraft. Instead of them being designed for the minimum possible weight with just the right strength, which means very fragile for the operation. Let's make it in a standard engineering design, built like a Brooklyn Bridge or a building. Let's make it out of steel, just ordinary steel. And let's make everything aboard it, life support systems, like a hotel. I kept saying we should have a, a conventional store-bought barber's char chair up there just to show how scornful we could be of anything that was up there just to save weight. Taylor and Dyson headhunted some 50 scientists and engineers for the project. Among them Jeremy Bernstein, a physicist at the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, where consultants were paid to think the unthinkable. 
And the Rand Corporation was like a malignant university. It was this faculty all devoted to the Cold War. In the physics division, for example, there was Herman Kahn, who, who was no longer with us, but he was then writing about megadeths and trying to habituate us to the idea that if we only killed a few millions here and there, it would come out all right in the end. It's a gigantic man who clearly had never missed a meal. This whole business of these mega deaths and everybody focused on H bomb tests and so on, I find rather found rather depressing. At this very time, the gossip was that uh, Dyson Freeman was in La Jolla. Uh, he had been bitten by a dog and he'd gone to a bullfight, and he was working on a on a spaceship. And so I wrote Freeman a letter, and I said, if any of these three things are true, being bitten by a dog or go to a bullfight or work in a spaceship, you're having a better time than I am, I wrote. Well, much to my amazement, a few days later, he called me and said, uh, you should come down here. At that time, a general atomic was known as generous atomics. People had wonderful summers and even winters on the beach in La Jolla. So it was kind of exotic. Restaurants served abalone steak and that sort of thing. You turn to me with a kiss in your De Hoffman's General Atomics was a multi-million dollar company set up after the war to exploit the peaceful power of the atom. De Hoffman had helped plan the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now he was wooing his fellow bomb makers away from the weapons labs to his research Shangri-La. The sun, to us the difference between life and death. It burns, stifles, dehydrates. But who would deny its warmth, its light, its beneficial radiation? So can it be with the energy man has created. The road is open, a road which may show us the cure for cancer, a road which may enable us to produce heat and power and new metals with atomic furnaces, new fuels, new ways to nourish the soil and correct vitamin and mineral deficiencies in the very food we eat. This can be our gift to generations yet unborn. We all thought that nuclear energy was a great boon to mankind at that time, and, and we all thought that nuclear energy would, would cure the problems of poverty all over the world, and there were big talk about what nuclear energy would do. And that, of course, was certainly very much a, 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 a driven by this feeling, well, we've used nuclear energy, and first of all, for killing people, now let's use it for doing something good. Dyson spent World War II helping to plan the bombing of Germany and many of the Orion scientists worked on the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. They brought this history with them to Project Orion. I do feel a moral responsibility for the almost 200,000 deaths. I had a small part in it, but still, that's an important ingredient, and that's a responsibility, it's not a regret. There's a difference. Project Orion was a way of doing things in a benign, peaceful way that relied on their previous military experience in some ways. So it was a, a translation of a sword into a plowshare. And I think that's a, a lot of the spirit that, that uh, imbued these people. Nobody really liked the sort of mass murder aspect of bombs, but. Uh, Nevertheless, they loved playing around with bombs. So this was a way of having your cake and eating it too, that uh, you could play around with bombs and still not be killing people, but exploring the, the universe.